Good morning, everybody. We're just going to wait a minute or two to let um, a few folks join, and then we'll get started here. Okay, it looks like we have quite a few participants, so we'll kick this off. Um, my name is Elizabeth Elbel, and I am the Oregon DEQ Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program Lead. Um, and as noted on our slide, today's presentation is going to cover new greenhouse gas reporting requirements for air permitted facilities. Um, so if you are um, responsible for reporting in another sector, for example, fuels or electricity. Uh, the material here may not apply to you, but we will be providing additional trainings uh, later this spring for those particular sectors. Um, I did wanna introduce our greenhouse gas reporting team. Um, today, uh, we have Jackson Dugan, who's our stationary source specialist, and he will be presenting um, the information in the slides here. But we also have Matt Steele, who is our fuels and natural gas specialist, and Mary Pleasant, our electricity sector specialist. And these are all folks that are part of a team um, that are helping us implement Oregon's greenhouse gas reporting program. Um, and we're tasked with implementing the reporting requirements to collect emissions data uh, and information from stationary sources, fuel and natural gas suppliers, electricity suppliers, um, and new this year, owners and operators of natural gas systems. So we use the information reported by these sources uh, to compile the statewide greenhouse gas inventory and to for inform different greenhouse gas policies and programs. Um, and uh, this information is very, very valuable. And our, I think our staff work very hard to provide technical assistance and support. So if at any point throughout the reporting process, you're in need of um, additional information, we encourage you to reach out through email or directly through phone to get the support that you need to comply with the regulation. Um, and with that, I will hand this off to Jackson uh, to get into the details of the new reporting requirement. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, my name is Jackson Dugan. I am a reporting specialist for permitted sources here at Oregon DEQ. And like Elizabeth mentioned, today we're going to cover some new reporting requirements um, that were adopted by the Environmental Quality Commission in May of 2020, and then uh, go over a few methods to satisfy those new reporting requirements, largely on what we call a supplemental reporting form that is new this year. I'll walk you through how to complete that, um, and we'll go from there. Just as a disclaimer, um, Elizabeth mentioned, but I just want to emphasize that this training is specific to stationary sources, permitted sources. Um, if you are an electricity supplier in Oregon, or if you are a fuel supplier in Oregon, um, the information in this training may not pertain to you. And so I would suggest that you wait for a subsequent training that will be offered by one of my colleagues to cover those sources or those sectors specifically. So on today's agenda, I kind of mentioned. Um, so we're going to start off, we're going to review some of the current reporting requirements or rather reporting requirements that uh, some of our um, reporters who have reported in the past will know and are familiar with. And then we're going to review some of the changes that were adopted last May by the EQC. Um, and that's kind of the bulk of this presentation. I'll introduce uh, what we call tier two, three, and four stationary combustion reporting and um, go over, like I said, that supplementary reporting form and show you how to do that. There have been some questions by reporters uh, so far this year uh, on where, to, where do we access that form? How do I complete this form? Um, 
where can I find it? How do I upload it? Things like that. So I'll, I'll walk through that process. And then we're also going to talk about um, what we call a designated representative, which is a new requirement. A special person has to submit your annual report to us. Um, I just want to say that the biggest impact of the changes to the rules um, are, excuse me, the biggest impact um, is largely requiring information from natural gas suppliers to us, which I'll get into, but most of the changes to the rules apply to large sources, okay, sources over 25,000 metric tons CO2E. Um, if you're a smaller source, if you are emitting under that threshold, uh, there's only going to be a few very small changes that you need to be aware of. But regardless of that, we're going to cover them all during this presentation. And um, if you do have questions, I will strive to answer those questions as they come in. But please um, go ahead and type them in the chat function of this meeting. And my colleague, Matt, will let me know when we have a list of questions that we need to address. OK. So just to give um, an overview, and like I said, just as a disclaimer um, to kind of assuage any concerns that maybe reporters have, uh, the majority of these updates impact our larger reporters. So those sources that emit over 25,000 metric tons CO2 equivalent um, and facilities that are reporting emissions other than stationary combustion or rather than or rather emissions in addition to stationary combustion. So we're talking about process emissions there. Um, if you're a smaller source under that large emissions threshold and you're largely just reporting stationary combustion emissions to our program, many of these changes will not pertain to you. There are a few that do though, so please pay attention. Um, one thing that hasn't changed is the general applicability of reporting to our program. So any source that holds a permit and emits over 2,500 metric tons of CO2 equivalent, that's 2,500, not 25,000, is required to report to our program on an annual basis. Uh, we are still requiring the use of EPA calculation methodologies with the exception with one exception um, of producers of fluorinated greenhouse gases in Oregon. And um, that's such a small cohort of sources that we're going to reach out to you individually with some of those updated reporting requirements. Uh, you still are required to use Easy Filer, our online reporting system, and you're still required to use DEQ forms, and you're still required to submit supporting documentation for any calculations that are done outside of Easy Filer. So those, there's some consistency um, in what was was required and what is required currently. Um, the new reporting requirements largely focus on providing additional details and um, additional information on emissions that are currently reported to our program. So another thing that I want to state, um, and many of you that have sent in questions thus far are aware of this, but we have delayed the reporting deadline this year. Normally, emissions reports are due March 31st. Um, this year, your 2020 emissions report is due April 30th, okay? Your 2020 emissions report is due April 30th of this year. There's an extra month to get those in, uh, just to accommodate these changes and to, to help you understand some of the updated reporting requirements. Okay, so we've covered um, some of the consistent reporting requirements between years. Now we're going to just do a brief high level um, topical overview of some of the updates to our rules. So beginning this year in 2021, there are some new reporting requirements. Um, we are asking for information from natural gas suppliers, uh, okay, um, to your facility. If your facility receives natural gas, we're asking for additional information on the supplier of that natural gas, uh, not necessarily the individual who owns the infrastructure, but the actual natural gas supplier. If you are a large source, okay, emitting 25,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year or more, once again, large sources, we're asking you to provide a narrative uh, explanation of any significant changes in emissions from a year to year. And that uh, threshold for counting as a significant change is a 5% difference, 5% increase or decrease in emissions between year. And that narrative can be a very small form. We'll go into it. Um, it can just be, we experienced an increase in production, for example. So, so not too much there that we're asking for. We're also gonna cover, um, there's some new requirements on cogeneration and electricity generating unit information. Um, if your 
source has a cogeneration unit, also called a combined heat and power system, or an electricity generating unit. We're asking for some additional information there. Uh, and then we're also asking for some additional information if you utilize liquid or gaseous biomass derived fuels. If you use a solid um, biomass derived fuel, such as wood, we're not asking for additional information. This just pertains to liquid and gaseous biomass derived fuels. And then also um, for a select number of reporters, uh, if you report using subparts H for cement manufacturing, subpart W for petroleum and natural gas systems, or subpart AA for pulp and paper manufacturing, Um, we're asking for some itemized fuel emissions uh, from those sources. And all of these new um, data elements that we're requesting with um, the 2020, beginning with the 2020 emissions reporting year um, in 2021, will be reported using a supplementary reporting form. And we'll cover that. This reporting form can be found in Easy Filer. It can also be found on our website. I'll show you where to find the form. And it will be uploaded into Easy Filer, uh, similar to where you have uploaded supplementary documentation in the past to our program. And I just want to stop there really quickly. Um, Matt, do we have any uh, questions thus far from our reporters? No, nothing yet in the chat. Okay. Um, for anyone who's just joining, um, who maybe missed the outset of this presentation, if you do have a question, feel free to uh, type it in the chat and I'll stop and try to answer questions as we go along. Um, and for anyone just joining, this presentation is specific to our permitted sources. Um, if you're a fuel supplier or an electricity supplier in Oregon, um, this information may not pertain directly to you. Okay, so starting off with some of the new reporting requirements, that first one that I talked about was uh, requesting new information for facilities that receive natural gas. So when reporting emissions from the use of natural gas, all sources are now required to report the name of the natural gas supplier, uh, the natural gas uh, uh, customer account information, and then the annual amount delivered um, according to the billing statement. So we want the annual amount delivered um, to be itemized by customer account. Um, don't give us a net amount, a total amount. We really do want it itemized. So this is new additional information. Um, and we I just want to emphasize that we're asking for the supplier of that natural gas, if it's a natural gas utility, um, a natural gas marketer, um, kind of that category. We're not necessarily asking for the, the uh, entity that owns the um, natural gas infrastructure. Um, so if you're being supplied by a marketer, for example, we're asking for the name of that marketer, that entity. Okay, um, so that's natural gas information. Um, so this significant change in annual emissions, once again, this will only apply to kind of those large sources, any small source that's just reporting stationary combustion, this most likely won't apply to you. Um, this is for those larger sources uh, that have 25,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent in emissions per year. And for you all that um, these larger sources we're now asking that you provide a narrative explanation of any significant change in emissions between years. And that significant change is a delta of 5%. So an increase or decrease in emissions um, by 5% between years. And like I said um, previously, this just needs to be a brief narrative. This, this, we're not asking for a significant amount of uh, text here. Um, you know, If there was an increase in demand for your product, that would be uh, substantial enough to um, satisfy this requirement. Similarly, if there was a contraction in demand for your product and there was a decrease in emissions, um, that would be sufficient as well as a reason for any decrease or increase in emissions that you experience between years. Um, and there are a few other examples, but I'm pretty sure that you can um, figure those out for yourselves. Um, energy efficiency equipment that comes online, things like that. So, some new information that we're requesting for any sources that have uh, cogeneration units or electricity generating units um, takes a few slides to cover. First, I just want to um, talk about what exactly an electricity generating unit is and then what a cogeneration unit is. So, when we're talking about an electricity generating unit, um, we're really talking about any combination of physically connected generators, uh, reactors, boilers, combustion turbines, or prime movers. 
uh, that when operated together produce electric power. And when I'm talking about a prime mover, um, I'm talking about steam turbines, um, combustion, gas turbines, hydro turbines, um, reciprocating engines, wind turbines, solar units, things along those lines. And then when we're talking about a cogeneration unit, um, we're talking about a unit that produces electric energy and thermal energy for uh, use at the facility through the simultaneous or sequential use of the original fuel energy and waste heat recovery. So a combined heat and power system is also used to describe a cogeneration unit and um, a cogeneration unit similar to an EGU uh, consists of a primary mover where fuel is converted into mechanical or thermal energy as well as a generator to transform the mechanical energy uh, into electricity. And then it also includes a heat recovery system to collect the produced heat. Uh, I think gas turbines are normally used um, in situations where the heat is used for kind of for spatial heating. And then maybe when a higher temperature heat is needed, uh, I think uh, gas, um, gas turbines are more appropriate. Uh, gas engines are used in the smaller case, excuse me. So those are kind of the definitions that we're looking at for EGUs or cogeneration units. And then let's get into the information that we're requesting from, from these systems. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop after this slide because I'm sure that we may have some uh, questions regarding this. So in addition to the reporting protocols, once again, we're relying on EPA's reporting protocols that hasn't changed um, in, our, in our past rules. We're still relying on those methodologies. Um, Subpart C and D, subpart D is reporting protocol for electricity generation. We're now asking for uh, the information on this slide for um, cogeneration and electricity generating units. We're asking for the name, the address, contact person and phone number for each facility. And at DEQ, um, we have a definition of facility that we follow. Uh, sometimes a source identified by a permit, an air quality permit, may have more than one facility, okay? Um, and we're asking, I'll, I'll go into the definition of the facility on the next slide, but we're asking for um, kind of EGU information and cogeneration unit information to be submitted to us on a facility basis, okay? Um, rather than as the source as a whole, for example. We're asking for facility identification numbers assigned by the Energy Information Administration, um, any identification assigned by CARB or the Energy Regulating Commission's um, PERPA qualifying facility program. We're asking for net and gross electricity generated um, and megawatt hours for our electricity generating units, those EGUs. And then for our co-generating units, we're asking for total thermal energy uh, generated and we need that reported separately for thermal energy that was provided for offsite use and then thermal energy that was provided um, for sources or not related to electricity generating generation. So let me um, pause there. Once again, I'm gonna cover the definition of facility on the next slide, but um, are there any questions thus far on things that I've covered? Matt, do we have anything coming in? Hi, Jackson. Uh, yes. Firstly, there's a question about whether emergency gen generators are categorically insignificant sources. So emergency generators, we've had a couple of questions on this. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to our program um, individually, and it can be a case by case basis for this instance. So um, one thing to consider is whether or not the emissions from an emergency generating unit are categorically insignificant. Um, so that's the first thing that we have to determine, and then we have to determine the purpose of that um, electricity generating pro generation from emergency generating units. So if you do have um, emergency uh, generators, um, please reach out to our program, um, and we have contact information at the end of this presentation, and we'll go through that individually. Um, it is a case-by-case -case basis for that. Um, I know that that's not the answer you want, but it is a case-by-case -case basis. So reach out to our program individually and we'll walk you through that. Are there any other questions, Matt? Yeah, just a couple more. Um, yep. Someone was also asking whether emergency generators are the same category as electrical generators. So um, they do generate electricity, emergency generators um, do fall under an electricity generating unit, but um, once again, I would encourage you to reach out to our program on a case-by-case -case basis. We're looking at this 
um, emergency generators, depending upon the purpose, when they're used, how they're used, um, they we're asking that information to re be reported separately um, or distinctly depending upon their use. So reach out to our program. Um, I'll walk through that individually and very um, expeditiously for each source. I won't take a lot of your time to walk through that. Uh, reach out to our program with those questions individually. And then what's the, what's any, any others, Matt? Yes, our last question for right now is um, how to report differently if you have a single account or multiple meters. I believe this um, applies to your natural gas suppliers. Yeah, so um, if you have, so if you're receiving natural gas, um, we're asking that you supply the natural gas on an account basis. Um, so if you have a single, if you have multiple customer accounts, we're asking that you supply the natural gas information based upon um, those customer accounts. So if you have three different customer accounts, um, we want the natural gas supplied to those individual three customer accounts um, rather than as the total natural gas as an aggregate for your facility, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, now, speaking of facility. One last um, one. Yep. Jack. Go for it, Matt. Perfect. Um, they would like to know if we're following the definitions in the um, rice regulations for when the or electrical generators are considered to be subject to our reporting program. Oh, um, that's a good question. I'd have to fall back on Elizabeth for that. Um, we have the definition in our rules of an electricity generating unit. Um, and our rules, Chapter 340 of Oregon Administrative Rules, Division 215, is um, where we draw all of the um, rule language that I'm talking about in this presentation. I don't know if we incorporate by reference or reference um, rice information in there. I don't think we do, but um, that's something that uh, I'll have to, Elizabeth, if you're, if you're still on the line, feel free to uh, jump in here. Yeah, I think that that's a good question. We do we have looked at that definition, and I think we're closely aligned with it. I, I think the main reason that Jackson um, is directing folks with uh, EG, these electricity generating units um, that may be kind of on the cusp of emergency generator versus not is that we do have some several, several and, and they're very limited permit situations where somebody may be operating uh, one of these emergency generators. Um, in, a, in a different capacity where they might be providing power to the grid. And in, and in, in that instance, uh, we would need that reported to us. Whereas in other instances where you're using it as a backup source, say if, if you're, you know, you lost power from the grid or for testing purposes, uh, we wouldn't necessarily need that information. Um, and so in order for us to kind of evaluate that more thoroughly, um, we'd like to be able to work with you. And especially like this initial year, to determine if yes, those units are categorically insignificant and operated in a way that they don't require this additional reporting or no, you fall into a circumstance where those are operated in a way that we would need that information. So um, so that's why we're asking for follow-up with, with uh, Jackson and our team to make sure we kind of help you through this, especially this first year of reporting. Thank you, Elizabeth, it's very helpful. Um, okay, so remember I was talking about with these EGUs and cogeneration units, um, we're asking for this on a facility level basis. Um, so let me talk about what that means, source versus facility. Um, so we require emissions to be reported from the source as a whole. And um, sometimes larger sources, so a source being identified by their permit at DEQ, their source number, their permit number, may include more than one facility. Um, that is on their source permit. And more than one facility, we define facility as any physical property, building, structure, um, or stationary equipment located on one or more contiguous or adjacent properties um, in actual physical contact or solely separated by a public roadway or other public right of way under common ownership or common control. Um, when more than one facility is covered under a single air uh, ACDP or Title V permit, report emissions from cogeneration and electricity generating units by uh, on the facility level basis, not in aggregate. Okay, um, and this only applies to a very small number of our sources 
for the vast majority of sources. This isn't um, germane to your reporting situation. Very small number of sources. Uh, this is pertinent to your uh, specific reporting situation. Um, if you're a smaller reporter, uh, this most likely doesn't doesn't pertain to you. So once again, this is a this is a small cohort of individuals that we're we're talking about. So. Uh, earlier, I talked about some additional requirements that we're asking for when it comes to liquid and gaseous biomass derived fuels. Uh, once again, we're not asking for additional information from any solid biomass derived fuels like wood or things like that. Um, but if you do utilize liquid or gaseous biomass derived fuels, we're asking for the name and the address of the vendor uh, from which the fuel was purchased. So if you purchase your fuel, your, your um, vegetable oil or something like that, from uh, company X, we're asking for the name and address of company X. Um, and then we're also asking for the name and address of the facility where the fuel is produced. So if company X supplies the fuel to you, but company Y is where the fuel was initially uh, produced, we're asking you to provide the um, contact, or not the contact information, but the name and address of both of these facilities, company Y and company X. And we're asking for the total amount of fuel delivered by each vendor. So each company X um, that you have in um, specific units, depending upon the fuel type, we need it in MMBTU for biomethane, if you use biomethane, standard cubic feet um, for uh, gaseous fuels, and then gallons for liquid fuels. Um, we did have a question earlier this reporting year, if you yourself are, um, producing biomethane or something like that um, and utilizing it on site. Um, since you're not purchasing this fuel, uh, there's no vendor from which you're purchasing this fuel. Um, there's no original fuel supplier that supplies a vendor and that supplies it to you. Um, this reporting requirement, you know, you, you wouldn't need to satisfy this reporting requirement. That's a different reporting situation. Um, this is really if you're sourcing liquid or gaseous biomass derived fuels, um, then we do ask for that company X, the vendor, and then company Y, the, the original producer of that fuel. Okay, um, let me cover one more slide and then and I'll stop for questions again. So for um, any of our reporters, our cement manufacturers, our uh, petroleum and natural gas systems, or our pulp and paper manufacturers, so those sources that are reporting using subparts H subpart W or subpart AA of 40 CFR 98, that's um, EPA's chapter that we follow. Um, we're asking for an itemized report of fuel use. Um, we would like the fuel use uh, and emissions to be reported separately for different fuel types uh, and quantities um, used in for these uh, subparts. And um, of course, this information will be reported on that supplementary reporting form. Um, which we will go through um, at the kind of towards the end of this presentation. Okay, let me, before we go into stationary combustion and multiple tier reporting, um, just let me pause for any questions. Matt, do we have some questions that have come in since then? No, there's no additional questions right now. Okay, great. I'm glad I'm covering it sufficiently. Um, so, Stationary combustion and multiple tier reporting. So what we were talking about previously, um, some of it pertains to process emissions um, for natural gas supply information. Some of that pertains to uh, stationary combustion. But um, in the past, uh, Easy Filer was really only configured to calculate emissions using what we call tier one uh, calculation methodology, um, which is just default. Um, plug in your total fuel usage in Easy Filer. Um, and then it was also configured to utilize tier four uh, reporting methodology. Now we can utilize um, tiers one through four calculation methodologies for stationary combustion. And um, the real crux of this kind of next couple of slides is one, um, for small reporters, um, the vast majority of you just utilize tier one, which is um, using default emission factors and default high heat values to calculate emissions from fuel combustion. And that's where you're just inputting your total fuel usage and then the units of that fuel usage in Easy Filer, and the system is calculating your emissions for you. There's default emission factors and high heat values in the system, and you're utilizing that to supply emissions to our program. 
for some of the larger facilities um, that maybe have an electricity generating unit or um, have more complex operations at their at their at their at the source um, for some larger sources, excuse me. Um, maybe you're using some more complex methodology and then you have the option um, to utilize a different calculation tier for, for your emissions. Um, so the second kind of crux of these next couple of slides is the following. If you're a larger source, um, so a large source, 25,000 metric tons CO2 equivalent of annual emissions or more per year. If you're one of these larger sources and you report to the EPA, please, please, please report to Oregon DEQ, the Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program, the same way that you report to EPA, the EPA Greenhouse Gas Reporting Program. If you utilize tier two to report to EPA, use tier two to report to our program. Um, we're asking for consistency across programs. Um, you know, that's federal, we're state. We're just asking for consistency in how the data are reported between the two programs. So report the same to our program as you report to EPA, okay? Um, so tier one, kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, this uses those default emission uh, emission factors and the high, high heat values, and then Easy Filer automatically calculates emissions for tier one um, in the system itself. So smaller sources, just reporting fuel uh, from stationary combustion, you're most likely using tier one. You most likely have in the past used tier one. So this really isn't a change for you. This is just additional functionality within Easy Filer for some of those more complicated, larger sources to utilize a different tier if they, um, if they need to. So the kind of the higher tiers, tiers two, three, and four, um, tier two uses default emission factors and then a measured annual average high heat value um, to calculate emissions from fuel combustion. Tier three uses the annual average carbon content of the fuel to calculate emissions um, from the combustion of that fuel. And then tier four uses a continuous emissions monitoring system or similar technology um, to measure emissions directly from the gas, that um, the stack of gas. Um, so if you're reporting uh, subpart D emissions, uh, electricity generation, um, and you use a SIMS, um, you most likely have reported uh, emissions from stationary combustion using tier four uh, calculation methodology. Um, so you know, continue to do that. Um, and for anyone who has reported using tier four um, in easy filer, uh, instead of, this goes for tier two, three, and four now, um, in easy filer, instead of um, inputting the total amount of fuel that was utilized in your system, you report the total emissions that you have calculated or measured from your system into easy filer. Um, and then upload supplementary documentation substantiating those emission calculations or those SIMS readings. Um, so it's, you know, it's a little different process. Um, you, need, you need to upload supplementary documentation if you're reporting using tiers two, three, or four. You do not generally need to upload supplementary documentation if you're just using tier one, which is the basic plug and chug, enter total amount of fuel and easy file or select the units. Um, it, you know, automatic calculation. Um, let me pause there again for any questions before I um, kind of move on to, next we're gonna cover the supplementary reporting form, um, kind of in detail where you input all this new data that we're asking for. Um, I'm gonna show you that, I'm gonna walk you through that process. Um, but before we do so, are there any other questions? Yes, we had one just come in that mentioned that there are differences between the DEQ and EPA uh, definitions of categorically insignificant emission sources. They would like to know if that's what you mean when you want them to report using the EPA methodology. No, um, if you report using, so what I talk about using EPA um, methodology, I'm talking about if you use tier two um, calculations for your stationary combustion for EPA, and in the past, you've, you've used uh, default emission factors and default high heat values for stationary combustion to Oregon DEQ. Please, now you need to report using tier two to our program. Um, we use um, Oregon specific rules um, for defining categorically insignificant emissions to our program. 
Um, all of the rules in our program, uh, we do incorporate by reference and rely on some calculation methodologies um, of 40 CFR 98, which is the EPA federal program. But we have our own definition of categorically insignificant emissions, um, and we are asking that you follow the Oregon definition in that instance. Um, any other questions? Yes, for the amount of fuels delivered, um, would you like them to report the amount of fuel delivered or the, only the amount of fuel that was actually combusted in the reporting year? This is for natural gas combustion, I assume. Yeah, for fuel deliveries for Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Elizabeth, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're asking for the total amount of fuel that was combusted. And Elizabeth, now I want, I want to stop before going any further in case I said it wrong. So the new reporting requirement, I, I believe it has to do um, with the total amount supplied. So that okay. would be what's on your billing statement as well. And we do provide, I believe, a note section so that, for example, if you um, we're storing natural gas on site, you could describe what the discrepancy is between um, what was combusted and reported versus what was supplied to your uh, source. So good question. And thank you, Elizabeth, for that clarification. So uh, like Elizabeth said, total amount supplied. Um, if there's a discrepancy between what was combusted and what was supplied, like Elizabeth said, um, there is a comment section in the form, which I can show you where you can um, provide a narrative of that discrepancy. Any other questions, Matt? Yes, a couple, I think, about the different tiers of reporting. Um, firstly, there was a question asking whether they can just upload their EPA report. For supplementary documentation, um, if you, so if you're using uh, a SEMS, um, it would be, we would ask that you would upload um, the actual readings from your continuous emissions monitoring system. Um, if you're using annual average carbon content of the fuel, um, we would ask that you would upload the documentation um, showing how you, you reached the value that you did for average carbon content. Um, and then if you're using um, average high heat values, um, we would ask for that documentation as well. Um, and Elizabeth, once again, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is all in addition to um, your uh, EPA report. Thanks, Jackson. So I guess just to clarify, um, so the requirement is to report emissions to DEQ and to provide supplemental documentation of how those emissions were calculated, if not calculated using our easy filer automated process. So to the extent that your EPA report has all of the data elements needed for us to verify what you've uh, reported to us, then that would be um, appropriate. And um, if it doesn't have uh, all of the sufficient information for verification purposes, you may need to upload additional supporting documentation, or we may, if we were, for example, auditing, request that type of information as well. Um, and I know in some instances, your EPA report may have several versions where there is a um, a redacted version or a public version. And so in those instances, we would ask for um, the one that has all of the information that we would need. And we can work through any confidential issues as well with that through our system and tool. Um, but it, it really depends on if your EPA report has all of the data elements needed for verification or if we would need additional elements such as Jackson was kind of describing um, to verify what you've reported to us. Great. Um, sounds like there's a few more questions, Matt. There are. Um, yep. Similar to the last one, um, if a source has separate um, emissions units, like it's classified as facilities under their federal reporting, um, but they don't report some of the smaller facilities um, for the EPA, how would you like them to deal with some of the different methods they might use then at the different um, facilities for their reporting of stationary combustion? Yeah, this is, um, once again, this applies to a very small number of reporters. Um, and because it's a, it's a special reporting situation, I have to bring in Elizabeth again, because um, we usually look at these on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so for facility, uh, we're looking at EPA's definition of facility. But before I say anything wrong or erroneous, I want to have Elizabeth's input on this. 
Right, so in the several instances that I can think of where we have, say, uh, a large source that maybe is reporting uh, under the definition of facility to EPA, but um, maybe combines those facilities under one source permit for reporting to our program. In those instances, um, depending on the facility, so if you were, for example, using a, a tier four emissions reporting for EPA for one facility, you would report that same way to our DEQ program. And then for the other facility, if you were, for example, using a tier one or a tier two, you would then use that corresponding method to report emissions to DEQ. All of that would be covered under your single source reporting emissions data report. And our um, easy filer tool is able to kind of handle that in terms of breaking out either at the unit level or facility level. So if you need assistance um, with kind of how to do that, since it's a little bit of like a higher, uh, a little bit more work in our reporting tool, then I think um, one of our staff could work with you on that to make sure that everything translated correctly. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, next, Matt, what's, what's our next question? Uh, last question for right now. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of sources would like to know if smaller mobile sources, such as a propane fuel forklift, need to be reported under their greenhouse gas emissions reporting to DEQ. So if you have, um, I, I don't know, I don't believe so. If you have a propane forklift or things like that. Um, so fuel combustion but, in like a, a vehicle or in a forklift such as that are not required to be reported to the greenhouse gas reporting program. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and once again, um, we do have um, some definitions of categorically insignificant activities that occur at facilities. Um, I would encourage our sources to look at that, um, those definitions and what is what is and is not considered a categorically insignificant activity at each source. Um, operations such as that uh, may fall under that category. Um, so I, I would encourage all our sources to look at that list um, of categorically insignificant activities. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Matt. So now we're going to um, walk through the supplementary reporting form. So this is an Excel document um, and uh, these slides were available uh, prior to uh, this presentation. Um, let me just quickly show you where to uh, download the supplementary reporting form in Easy Filer, though. So I'm on Easy Filer's um, page. Um, if you want to do this right now and just walk through the form with me, you can. Um, within Easy Filer, once you log in, if you go uh, to the Upload Required Attachments page over here, Upload Required Attachments. Um, this all this text is new. Do you see this download supplementary reporting form up at the top? And I'll zoom in for you. Um, go ahead and click on that, and then you're able to download and um, fill out the report. Report, and this is the same place where you'd upload that report. Choose file, and then upload. So, that being said, let's just walk through the supplementary reporting form. Um, so, when you do download that document. Um, you're going to be presented with just um, a general instructions on uh, filling out the form, um, what we're using the form for, and then because there are uh, some new reporting requirements that we've gone over, uh, included is kind of a question and answer section to help ascertain whether or not you need to um, report this new information to our program, and then which of the, the subsequent reporting tabs you need to complete. So for example, did you use, did your, did the source use natural gas in the past reporting year? Yes, you're required to report this natural gas supplier information tab. Um, if you're a large source, you know, did you produce more than 25,000 metric tons um, uh, CO2 equivalent in the past year? Um, yes, okay. Was there an increase or decrease at delta of 5%? Yes, okay. We need to report or um, complete the significant change reporting form. Uh, similarly, you know, electricity generating unit, co-generation units, um, 
If you don't know what that is, there's a definition for you. Um, so, you know, all of, all of this is pretty, um, it's, it's there to help, help ascertain whether or not um, this form is germane to your specific reporting situation and then which of the subsequent tabs need to be completed by your source and the individuals completing your annual greenhouse gas report. Um, at the end of this form, there's a little tab directory, again, with some additional information on whether or not you're required to complete that tab. Um, so let's say um, that I am a very unique facility or I'm a very unique source, excuse me, I'm a very unique source and um, I'm lucky enough to have to complete all tabs in this document. Um, let's, so that, that's what I have to do. I have to complete all tabs in this document. First thing that I'm gonna do and the first thing that all of you are going to do is complete this company information tab, okay? Um, all of the subsequent reporting tabs in this document pull from this company information form. Um, if you do not complete this form, there will be some errors in your reporting, um, uh, in your, your greenhouse gas emissions report, um, and we may have to contact you um, just to provide us with that information. So, you know, you'll select your emissions year, you'll provide us with um, uh, your permit number, um, and then, of course, your company name, um, and then the preparer name, so I'm Jackson, uh, email address, phone, uh, facility address, things along those lines. Uh, company name, please, please, please uh, report what's on your permit. Um, we are asking for, you know, email that you use um, to be similar across um, our programs, even though we do have different staff that satisfy different programmatic requirements at DEQ, but please um, provide the company name that's on your permit. Sometimes we have company names that are abbreviated, um, things like that, and sometimes it's just hard to align with um, data when, when we have different company names attached to a similar, the same permit number. So you've completed this form, and now the first thing that I need to do, because I'm a special source and I get to complete all these tabs, is uh, complete my natural gas supplier information form. So um, all of this pulls from our, um, company supplier information. Don't need to fill that out. You can't even click on it in here. You can only click on these um, gray activated cells. So please, like was mentioned earlier in the presentation, please supply um, the total amount of gas received, um, the total amount of gas combusted. So there we can see the, the difference between the two. Um, you know, if you receive a certain amount and then combust a different amount, please provide um, those, those two amounts there and then provide a narrative explanation as to, you know, that difference. Um, and then we're asking for the natural gas supplier name. Once again, we're asking for the natural gas supplier, whether this is a utility or a marketer, um, we're not necessarily asking for the entity that owns the natural gas infrastructure. We're asking for the supplier. Provide us um, information on the type of supplier, whether they're an interstate pipeline, marketer, utility, um, the account information, and then, like was saying earlier, the annual amount delivered by that account number. Um, and then at the end of all of these forms, we're asking for um, preparer name and then just the date. Um, that the form was completed. So great, I've completed my um, natural gas supplier information. Um, now I'm a large source. Um, I'm not a small source, I'm a large source and I need to uh, complete this significant change form. And I'll stop um, after a couple more tabs for questions um, just so that we don't have a long list at the end of this. So large source, there was a delta of you know 10% between years. Um, let me just provide an explanation as to that. Um, once again, you can't edit any of these. You can only edit the gray, so it's easy, you know, easy to go. Um, we're asking for total emissions, so that includes biogenic and anthropogenic emissions um, for the most recent reporting year. So let's say that um, this is for 2020, for example, and then for emissions of the most recent prior year. So that in in all of our reporting situations right now that would be 2019 emissions that were reported to our program. Um, 
And there was a pretty large decrease in this example, um, a 94% decrease. We definitely want an explanation for that. Um, and then just provide us an explanation here. Um, decrease in demand for product. Um, and then maybe you took um, some boilers offline at your facility. Um, maybe you replaced all of your equipment with really uh, energy efficient um, equipment. Um, maybe you installed photovoltaic systems. Um, you know, we're asking for that information to substantiate this change in emissions. Um, and similarly, if this is an increase, maybe you you added some boilers. Maybe um, maybe your PVs broke. Um, you know, on, on your roof um, and you needed to increase your natural gas usage, um, just anything along that. So let me um, let me do one more tab and then we'll stop for questions because this is the electricity and co-generations reporting form and I have a feeling that we may have some questions um, after this after this reporting form. So um, like I said kind of earlier in the presentation, we're at Asking for some, um, whether that's your EI, um, Energy Information Administration identity, your CARB identification information, or the PERPA um, identifying information. Um, and then if you are one of those lucky sources um, that has multiple facilities, um, we're asking for that additional facility information. Um, you know, for most of you, um, A, for most of you, most of our reporters in general, this, this form does not apply. And then for even a smaller subset of reporters, um, you'll have to fill out this second facility information. Um, but for the vast majority of you, if you do have an electricity generating unit or a co-generation unit, um, you're just gonna fill out one half of this section on this upper part of the form. Um, for electricity generation, if you have an EGU, um, we're asking for you know, your facility name, the electricity generating unit name, you know, in EGU one, EGU two, um, the the type, the electricity generating unit type, um, gross, and then net um, electricity generated. And there's just um, if, if you need, there's a definition of uh, gross and net that we're asking for in there. Um, and then for cogeneration, so it's, you know, once again, this is something also called a combined heat and power system. At your facility or your at the source, we're asking for a facility name if you have multiple facilities, um, co generation unit type, and then your thermal energy for off site and then on site use in MMBTUs. Uh, and then if you if you are uh, reporting using subpart D, for example, electricity generation, um, and you're using a continuous emissions monitoring system to report emissions there. Um, we're asking for you to please report, um, fill out this section of the form where we're asking for information on fuel type used um, that um, is combusted where those emissions are red um, in the, using the SEMS. Um, we're asking for the total amount of fuel combusted, the measurement units, um, MMBTUs, gallons, um, et cetera, total emissions. And then, you know, since this is really just electricity generation, your applicable subpart is subpart D. Like all of the past forms that, that I've completed so far, I would have to input my name um, and then just the date on this as well. Um, so let me pause there. We have two more tabs in this, in this reporting form. We have a biomass fuel emissions form and then a reporting form for our um, cement manufacturers, petroleum and natural gas systems, and our pulp and paper manufacturers. So if you have questions, we're going to cover that in just two seconds. But right now, um, Matt, do we have any questions thus far? I think there might just be a little bit of confusion for the small number of facilities that might have multiple facilities underneath one air contamination permit and how you'd like them to input those multiple facilities into this form. Yeah, okay. Um, so let's see, that is EGU and code generation form. Um, so one would be to make sure that the definition of multiple facilities, um, you know, what we're defining, let me go back here, as facility, sorry, I know this isn't the best way to do this, but um, please, you know, first 
consult this definition of facility, um, you know, if it doesn't meet this definition, it's not a separate facility. It needs to meet this definition. Um, and then if you do have, you know, you do have multiple facilities under one source permit, um, we're asking for the, the information. So your, your identification information um, per facility. So um, your EIA number for each facility, um, the second facility name, for example, um, if, if, this, if you're getting this information from a different individual, most likely this preparer is the same as you, but if you have to send this off to a different person um, to fill out their, their contact or their name and contact information, um, the second facility address, um, and then identification information for that second facility. Uh, and then down here where you have facility name, say this is for facility one and this is for facility two, um, you know, and this has first facility address, um, first facility slash company name would be test in this instance. Um, for test, I had EGU unit, um, alpha one, um, electricity generating type, gross electricity, net electricity, for electricity for facility name two, or for the second facility, I have facility two, facility two, I had beta one, electricity generating unit type, gross, net. Um, so we're asking for information to be reported that way. Um, similar for cogeneration units, um, okay, well, I also, you know, at, at test, I had cogeneration unit gamma, um, fill out that information. Oh, well, at facility two, I also have a cogeneration unit that's delta, um, fill out the information for delta in there um, on, on a facility level basis, okay? Um, and then for your SEMS information, um, that should just be for your um, your individual EGU. But I'm seeing that if you have in a very rare instances for a very small subset of reporters, if you have um, uh, multiple EGUs at different facilities and you also have emissions that are being read for those um, EGUs, um, uh, by via a SIMS, so you have multiple SIMS for multiple EGUs. Um, we have provided you just with one section to, to fill out that information. So, and if that's the case, um, then fill out all the all of your fuel types that were combusted in these systems, um, and then provide a note, um, provide uh, just just a word document or something along those lines that um, delineates which fuel was used in which system. Um, and, you know, I, I used distillate number two, I used diesel in test, I used um, coal or I used wood um, in, in facility two um, and upload that along with this document in the supplementary um, uh, upload section of EC Filer. Um, Okay, any other questions thus far, Matt? Do companies need to report under this tab if they're only running an emergency generator for power outages? Uh, in general, in general, no. But um, so if anyone joined kind of late, um, we were talking about emergency generators. Um, if you do operate emergency generation, if you do operate emergency generators, reach out to our program, reach out to me, um, contact information is at the end of this presentation. And we'll go through that on a case by case basis. Um, like Elizabeth mentioned earlier, there are a few instances um, that are a little um, opaque, they're a little um, nebulous in uh, what the purpose of emergency generators are. Um, sometimes maybe electricity is fed back to the grid. Um, so that's on a case by case basis in general, in general. Um, if you're just operating your emergency generators um, when you do not have electricity or power supplied by a utility, and that's the only time you're operating them or maybe testing or maintenance, 
um, then no. But once again, please reach out to us and we'll walk through that on a on a case by case basis. And I will be expeditious in answering those questions on a case by case basis so that um, I don't take up too much of your time. Any other questions, Matt? For again on the um facilities where there's multiple facilities under one permit. Mm -hmm. um, you just walk through how you'd like that input on the com company information and natural gas supplier tabs, specifically if each facility has a different natural gas supplier. So oh, that's a good question. Um, so on the company tab, we're really looking for um, the information as it appears on your permit on this tab. Okay. Um, so we're looking for, you know, company 11, 11, 11, the information that's included on the permit. We'd like that information to be put here. If you have a second facility at your, um, at your operations, um, then that second facility information would go in here. Okay. That, that subsequent facility information. Um, since the majority of our sources do not have these multiple facilities, um, you know, this, it just isn't useful to have multiple facility addresses on this form or on this company information tab. What's listed in your permit goes here. If you have an additional facility, um, that additional facility information goes here. Um, for natural gas supplier information, if you have um, more than one supplier going to different facilities, when when we're asking for information to be reported on a facility level basis, um, we're primarily asking for that information when it comes to electricity generation units and cogeneration units. Um, for natural gas supplier information, we're just looking at um, the source, so the permit uh, in that instance. And so you would just input your natural gas supplier name. Um, you know, say you have company X, Y, and Z. Um, you would you would list out all of the natural gas suppliers from which you receive gas. Um, this doesn't need to be reported on a facility level basis. This is um, the source as a whole. Um, and then you know even if these are multiple, say one is a marketer, X is a marketer, Y is an interstate pipeline, um, and Z is a natural gas utility. Um, report that as such um, uh, as it's illustrated here. Um, but yeah, that facility, that secondary facility um, stuff really comes in when we're talking about electricity generation units and cogeneration units, um, doesn't come in when we're talking about natural gas supplier information, doesn't come in when we're talking about significant change in emissions, um, doesn't come in when we're talking about biomass fuel emissions from liquid or um, gaseous biomass derived fuels. Really, it comes in when we're talking about um, electricity generating units and cogeneration units. Um, and once again, please, I would encourage you, um, first thing, look at this definition of a facility. Um, our intent was not to complicate um, the reporting process with this. The, um, once again, this only applies to a very small number of sources. Um, this, is not, this does not apply to a, 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 bra a broad swath of reporters. This is a very small number of reporters. So um, look at the definition of facility on slide 10 of this presentation um, and see if it actually applies to you. Um, in the vast majority of cases, it most likely does not. So that's just a caveat, just something to think about. Um, okay, any other questions, Matt? No, that's it for now. Great. Um, okay, so I am this special source that I have to complete all of these tabs. Um, I've completed my electricity generation unit, cogeneration unit form. I've explained why there was a significant decrease in emissions or significant increase in emissions between years. Now, let me uh, report information from biomass and liquid derived fuels. So once again, um, if you're using wood or a, a solid, any solid um, biomass derived fuels, you do not need to complete this form. Once again, any solid biomass derived fuels, you do not need to complete this form. This is just for liquid or gaseous biomass derived fuels. Um, so in the example um, that I gave earlier, um, company X supplied me with um, uh, vegetable oil, for example. Um, I want company X's name. I want their street address, uh, 123 Mission, for example. Um, I want the city 
um, XX and I want the states. If they're in Oregon or wherever they may be, let's, um, they're in California in this instance. Um, well, Oregon usually, but, um, and then we also want the company name for the fuel production facility. Um, so company X, uh, which was the vendor that supplied me with the vegetable oil, um, the original producer of that vegetable oil was company Y. Um, and we want the information for company Y as well. Um, and then on a vendor by vendor, fuel producer by fuel producer basis, we would like you to identify um, the fuel type that you received with what your gaseous or liquid um, biomass derived fuel is. Um, in this example, it's vegetable oil. We need the amount delivered, um, a significant amount of vegetable oil. Um, and then we need it to be reported in the uh, appropriate gallons, uh, appropriate units here. Um, so biomethane needs to be reported in MMBTUs, um, anything gaseous, standard cubic feet, anything liquid needs to be reported in gallons. Um, that is, so that's kind of the information we're asking for when it comes to liquid and biomass derived fuels. Um, we are asking for vendor who supplied it to you, the fuel original fuel producer, and then the gas, the amount of fuel delivered on a vendor by vendor, um, producer by producer basis. So you can see that this is one line. So we need you to report um, for each fuel that you receive, um, kind of in a, in a stream of of um, how that fuel is handed off from the producer to the vendor to you, the amount of fuel that's delivered. Um, so don't we don't want you to report you received. 25,000 gallons of um, vegetable oil in aggregate, we need you to report that on a vendor by vendor basis. Elizabeth, do you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify because I think this came up earlier. If, for example, um, you are combusting a biomass based fuel like a landfill mm -hmm. gas or a biogas um, at your source, and, and that is something that's derived maybe from your own operations. We would want you to just report yourself under this vendor and fuel production so that we could verify the source of um, the biomass drive fuel that you're reporting. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear for everybody. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so even though you won't have a vendor or a supply or a or a production facility that's different from your own, um, re report yourself as all of that information. Um, and as previously, we just need you to supply the preparer individual who did this and then the date who completed this form. Um, and lastly, um, so I'm the special source. My last job here is um, reporting information for um, subparts H, W, and AA, which is uh, cement manufacturing, petroleum or natural gas systems, and then pulp and paper manufacturing in that order. Um, so once again, this applies to a small subset of reporters, um, any of our small reporters, not generally pertinent um, to your reporting situation. Um, but for any, any, any source reporting under these subparts, we're asking for you to um, report fuels kind of in an itemized fashion. Uh, we would like you to report the amount of fuel, the total amount of fuel, the, or the fuel type used, the total amount of fuel combusted, um, units for that fuel, MMBTU, Etc. emissions, and then whichever subpart you're reporting under. Um, and since we're asking for um, all uh, kind of fuel usage across the facility, we're asking for, uh, or the source, excuse me, um, we're asking for, you know, if you're, if this is your stationary combustion fuel usage, subpart C, um, if you're a petroleum and natural gas system and, and you have both stationary combustion and um, subpart W, then we're looking for the fuel combusted that it goes into your subpart W reporting form, um, similar pulp and paper manufacturing or um, cement manufacturing. Um, so hopefully that's straightforward. Um, prepare name, date. Once you have uh, completed this form, once you've, you've um, filled out all of the tabs that you need to fill out, um, we're confident in the accuracy of our data, um, go ahead and save the form, just save it. And um, then 
you will upload that form in EasyFiler. Um, so you'll go back to, you've logged into EasyFiler on the same page where you downloaded the supplementary reporting form. Um, you're now going to just upload it in that same location. Choose file, upload. Um, this is the same, this um, upload required attachments uh, kind of sub page in here. That's, that's this page. It's the same place where you would upload um, any uh, supplemental documentation on emissions that are not calculated in EasyFiler. So not only is this the place where you upload your supplementary reporting form, this is the same location where you upload um, su uh, supplementary information in general, documents uh, substantiating any calculations that um, are not done in EasyFiler for emissions totals. So um, let me pause again, and we just have a few more slides in the presentation, um, but let me pause there and um, see if we have any questions that um, I need to, to, to address. Matt, how do we stand? No, I think maybe just at the end, we can open it up for questions. Great, awesome. Um, okay, so just a few more uh, slides here. Uh, uh, talking about uh, a designated representative. So now we have a requirement that um, each uh, emissions report in EasyFiler must be signed off or must be submitted rather by um, a designated representative at the facility. Um, so for any large or any Title V source, the designated representative is your responsible official at your facility. Um, but just know for our ACDP holders, um, you now have to have a kind of a, a specific person that needs to uh, submit the report, um, and they just need to, they just need to be designated within within the company um, as the designated representative that submits the report on behalf of, of the entity. Um, I think, like I said before, um, always 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 upload supplemental documentation when reporting emissions that are not automatically calculated in EasyFiler. Um, and we do ask you to retain a lot of documents um, in case we do need to go back and audit reports and we ask for additional information. Um, but one of the first places that we look when we are auditing a report and looking at how emissions were calculated is the supplementary documentation that is uploaded with the report. Um, if there's no supplementary documentation that is included with the report, we will reach out to you by default. Um, so please upload any documentation for emissions that are not calculated automatically in EasyFiler. So process emissions, things like that. Um, and now I just wanna open it up to uh, questions in general from our um, reporters. Thank you so much um, for your patience. I know this was a lot of information. Um, if you do have questions, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and we will um, unmute you and you can ask your question and we'll do our best to answer that. So thank you very much. Any questions? Or Thanks. you can type it in the box if you need. Thanks, Jackson. I just, I know that maybe a couple of you guys uh, might have joined us late and that we had a few questions about this, um, but we have extended the reporting deadline for the reporting of 2020 emissions this year. So the deadline to submit uh, your report and this additional supplemental reporting form is now April 30th. Um, so I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that extension, just in case um, this new information is causing you a little bit of anxiety around reporting. So thank you. Yeah, um, let's see. It looks like Cassandra, um, you have a question. Hi, um, thank you for this presentation. It's very helpful. I did have, I think I just wanted some clarification. Um, specifically for uh, for us at least um, biodiesel that's combusted in emergency generators. Um, so I understand that that we're being asked to um, include how much of that is delivered to the site. Um, I just want to make sure that 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 you're still or that there's no requirement that we use that amount for our subpart C um, kind of fuel combusted? Um, so since this is emergency generators, um, once again, we would have to look at that 
your your reporting yeah, situation? Yeah, we do. We, yeah, we do report uh, only not not in the mandatory reporting rule because it is categorically insignificant. But for easy filer, okay. we we have historically included, um, you know, the the combustion of diesel in our emergency generators. So, uh, under oh. subpart C. So okay. Cassandra, for the reporting of emissions under subpart C, it should just be based on the amount of fuel consumed. So that methodology hasn't changed. Okay. In, ter in terms of, um, it's like I, I mentioned before, a lot of the information around these biomass derived fuels is for verification purposes. So in terms of verifying that it actually was a biomass derived fuel. Um, and so we understand that there may be discrepancies between what you received and what you actually combusted. Okay, um, great. And, and that seems very reasonable. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that there wouldn't be, you know, questions later around, you know, why are these different? <laughs> right, no, I think that's a very valid concern. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, you can you can raise your hand in Zoom, or um, if you don't want to speak, um, you can type your or you can't speak. Um, you can type your question into our chat box, and Matt will ask it for you. We have a couple of quick just process questions about how to do this reporting, Jackson. Firstly, yep. um, does the designated representative need their own account to log into Easy Filer? They do. The designated representative has to have their own account in Easy Filer. The certification um, in Easy Filer is tied to the account and the individual's name who's on that account. So the designated representative needs their own account. And secondly, what's the process for the designated official to sign the reports? Um, do they need to sign it and upload the signed document into Easy Filer? There's a certification statement in Easy Filer that they just need to click. I certify that um, these emissions are true and accurate to the fullest extent possible. Um, there's, they don't need to sign. They don't need to do a wet ink signature and upload that that a signature to us. They just need to be the individuals that select that. Um, I certify that this emissions report is true and accurate, and then um, sign off type in their, their password and submit the report. Elizabeth, it looked like you had something to add though. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna add that, um, you know, our website for Easy Filer is the same address um, and all the information is there as well as our greenhouse gas reporting resources page, which includes um, all of our protocol documents and our user guides, as well as information about the supplementary reporting form. So, um, within that user guide, there's information about how to create a new account if your designated representative needs to do so. Right. Thank you, Elizabeth. And then at the end of this presentation, there's a list of um, some resources for um, all of you if uh, you need. So we have a link to the reporting tool, um, easy filer, we have the user guide, um, some reporting resources. Um, this so we're going to take, I'm going to take some of the questions that were asked today and upload our frequently asked questions document. Um, there's been a lot of questions on emergency generator uh, use. So I'll provide some information in there on that. Um, and uh, yeah, so th there's some resources here linked in the presentation for you. Uh, what other questions do we have, Matt? I think we've answered all the questions in the chat. Okay. If you have your question, feel free to put it back at the bottom there and I apologize. Okay, um, I just wanna say we'll, we'll continue to remain here for a little while um, in case any questions do come to you all. Um, if you have questions after this presentation, we've been recording this presentation and we will post it um, on our website. Um, so you can review it if you need. We also have a session, a training session tomorrow afternoon if you were only available to attend the second half of this training, for, for example, um, you can log on tomorrow and register and attend the first half if you'd like. Um, there's some contact information for me. Um, Jackson Dugan um, is, is myself. Um, Elizabeth is our program manager who has also been answering questions. Um, and uh, I am available to answer any sector specific reporting questions for air permitted facilities. Um, just go ahead and email our uh, GHC report at deq.state.or.us and we'll get back to you as soon as uh, we can with the information. Um, 
Yeah. And I just also want to emphasize, um, you know, please, please do ask questions throughout the reporting reporting process. If you have any questions, um, we would much rather uh, we would much rather prefer reports to be submitted accurately um, rather than uh, with errors that we need to go back and correct or reach out to you all to help explain to us. Um, and if that requires answering a multitude of questions during the reporting process, I'm happy to do that. Um, if you have questions on how to input data into EasyFiler, I'm happy to walk you through that process. Um, so we are available and we are here to uh, make sure this is an easy, easy process for you all to undertake. And if we don't have any questions coming in, I have a couple that just came in here actually, Jackson. Well, First, when preparing the report in EasyFiler, if you have different people who are preparing the report and certifying the report, how should you manage that? The person preparing the report can prepare the report as they normally do. The individual who certifies the report then needs to, um, they need to, if they don't already have an account, they need to create an account in EasyFiler. They need to then go in um, and they need to be the ones that submit the report. Great. And if a location has multiple facilities that each um, have to do Title V reports, who should be the designated representative that submits an easy filer? Multiple facilities that have to do Title V reports. So, hmm, um, I'm trying to think how that would. So, it, it may be a year. Title V permit holder. So if you're the individual who asked this question, feel free to um, ask it verbally too, to help clarify how I'm thinking about this. Um, your resp the responsible official for any Title V that's reporting to our program, the designated representative is the responsible official on um, for your Title V um, annual permit that you submit to permitting. Um, so if you're, a, if you're a company or an entity with multiple Title V permits, which it, um, which is multiple sources, not multiple facilities, um, then you would have the designated representative for each of those permits um, submit the, the um, emissions report. Elizabeth, did you want to add anything? Yeah, so when you report your greenhouse gases uh, to Oregon DEQ, everything is reported on a, a permit or source basis. So each individual uh, Title V permit should have its uh, unique submission. Um, and in those instances, then it would be the corresponding responsible official that should do the submission for that uh, Title V permit information. Yeah, I think maybe I can offer a little bit more clarification here now. Um, I think okay. they're saying that the location has multiple responsible officials under one Title V permit because they have multiple facilities that are reporting on the site. Then so in instances like that, it should be the same designated responsible or designated official, sorry, responsible official, I believe is the term, um, that's submitting your air permit report. Um, and that that's how we've kind of dealt with this issue in previous instances. So um, it, this does sound like it's probably a unique situation. So perhaps it's better to kind of take this offline um, and work through that with our with your permit writer as well. That's the end of the questions we have right now, Jackson. Okay. Um, well, we've been online for about an hour and a half. So uh, I appreciate everyone for joining us today. Um, like I said, we have been recording this presentation. We will post it on our website um, in a few days time. Um, and if you do have any questions, um, please reach out to the program. Uh, I'll let Elizabeth say anything that she wants to for the, for the close of this training, but um, thank you for taking the time to join and I look forward to helping you during this reporting season. Thanks, Jackson. And uh, yes, thanks to everyone that's joined us. Please do reach out to the program with questions um, through email or through phone call. We're happy to set up time to work with you on this um, and support you in compliance with the reporting. So um, thank you. Thank you so much.